Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the all, all the ones that confused about the title, yes, it's supposed to be about suspense, but there, there is something with the schedule that so they asked me to talk, uh, to replace my lighting talk from yesterday, and talk about microfrontends. So we switch between one buzzword, suspense, and we're going to talk <laughs> about another buzzword, microfrontends. Uh, and since this is like the last session, I know we are all really want to like finish it up and go go grab a beer. Uh, so maybe I'll do some kind of lighting talk. Uh, <laughs> so, but I will do it quick without a lot of code and demos. Um, so let's start. Um, thank you for all the sponsors. Um, let's start with a story. <laughs> Who here knows WeWork? Like WeWork, the company. Okay, it was really hard to not read it out about it in the news. Um, <laughs> but for the ones that don't know, we work. We have like hundreds of spaces around the world, buildings that we rent for others to work. And there are a lot of people in these buildings, like we work employees, that doing really really important jobs. That those are the actually the ones that operate the buildings, like. They're doing tons of things like for sales, like people come to the building and they need to sell them space to operation, if they need to fix something, if they need to clean some, uh, if they need to call someone to clean the office. They're doing hospitality and events and connecting between people. They're doing tons of work, okay? Um, and I'm afraid to say, I'm a bit shy that we didn't have anything like technology-wise for them until a couple of years ago. So imagine those people sitting in their front desk, tons of people come to them asking for stuff, and they are managing all their building with pen and paper, or Excel, okay? Excel is the, uh, the best option they have. So we had a couple of uh, engineers in house, and we looked at them and we understand the situation, so we built for them very simple application. How simple? Like that simple. One web page with input, so they are able to search some stuff, like the name of the company or the name of the member. So every time someone comes to them, they are able to like, excuse me, what's your name? Oh, okay, you are from this company. Okay, no problem, I will send someone to fix this. And when you uh, click on the specific item, you'll get a detailed uh, information about I don't know, this, for example, a company page. Um, so you can see how much they pay, how much they need to pay, where it sits, very basic stuff. Uh, and we call it the uh, space station, like space station, it's got, never mind. Um, so this is like the first version uh, of the application. and. Users being users, once you give them one finger, they want all the end, like they start to asking like tons of features. So two or three years afterward, things gotten a bit bigger. How much bigger? Like this is a mock of one of our latest versions. You suddenly see that there are like Navigation bar with billings and companies and emails that they send, and on the dashboard you are able to uh, see all the events that are happening right now, and who is going to have a birthday, and who is going to uh, go to the building uh, today, and like tons of features. And I don't blame them because they really need to do a lot of work. Uh, and behind the scene, to build this kind of system, we came from a really small team of I don't know, something like five engineers with one product manager and one designer that will dissolve and actually um, responsible to everything that comes uh, into the system to a lot of things, like a lot of people detaching your code base and putting a lot of features, a couple of designers and product managers that think differently about the product, they have a different vision, uh, and they're all working on the same GitHub repo, the same code, the same component. <coughs> it's got a bit strange and complicated. And actually, it was chaos. 
And in this point, we had two options, right? One of them is really simple, like business as usual. Uh, let's see how it goes. Let's see if we um, can like, manage more people or code. And basically, let's wait for this to explode. Um, this is a valid option. Uh, but the more responsible option is like to stop and play how we're going to uh, grow, are we going to scale uh, in the next uh, year? Because we are keep growing. Now we are 10 teams, soon you're going to have 15 teams and hundreds of people touching the same code base and developer velocity got like a lot of pain. Okay, so we obviously uh, choose to plan ahead um, and in this point I got involved uh, in the process. Um, it's basically, we had like a meeting because everyone suffered and we really want to do something. Uh, and in this meeting, they look for volunteers to lead it out. And I was the only one that didn't listen in the uh, meeting. I was like going over my Twitter feed. Um, so they volunteered me, um, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I didn't uh, introduce myself. I'm Sean McNeely, I'm a staff engineer at Europe. Um, I invest, I invest in uh, Tel Aviv as well, um, and like being a senior engineer that getting some kind of this kind of responsibility, obviously the first thing that you're gonna do is googling things stuff, uh, Google some stuff. Okay, I didn't really know what's going to be, what is the solution. I I never faced this kind of problem. Um, so I basically started reading some blogs, uh, uh, seeing some videos, uh, uh, calling my friends, calling my colleagues, and seeing what other companies and other teams are doing. Because it's obviously not our uh, like a unique solution just for us. Uh, and in this point, I like this is the first time that I heard about microphones, and. Once you Google microphone you got tons of talks and blog posts about how to implement microphone and, and all the company that face this exact problem. And when I read those posts or watched those videos, the lesson that I got from this is, hey, we are a company X that has this kind of problem and we implement our own solution. It looks like this. But you can't use it because it's internal solution and you didn't um, and it's uh, like only for our case and it's not open source. So good luck with this. Uh, and it didn't give me a lot of uh, power or uh, a lot of things to do. But I did see some stuff. Okay. What I saw is like there is. A common pattern between a lot of companies that uses uh, that are using web apps, especially now uh, these days, where React, and Vue, and Angular are so popular, and it's, it's relatively easy to write big applications. So the pattern goes goes something like this: you start with a very small application, like a POC that a couple of engineers started, maybe as a side project, maybe as an hackathon, just to push things out to see how it goes, then it actually was successful, so a team or, or, or a couple of teams uh, adopted and, and now pushing it to production, like a mature product, maybe they rewrote it, maybe they took the POC and uh, changed a couple of stuff, but it evolved into a real product that user actually uses. And this product is successful, this is the problematic stuff. Like, this is a problem. Those, this product that you didn't really anticipate or so that it's gonna be so huge, it's got so successful that other teams and other users gonna want to use it. So it became some kind of framework or portal that everyone gonna jump in and want to add one single thing or one feature only to this uh, person or only to this page. And fast enough, this framework came to, into a mess, okay? Because you didn't know from like the POC or the product phase that it's gonna get to this like scale, okay? That's that's okay. 
we are software engineers, we don't want to premature, uh, we don't want to introduce premature optimization, but at this point, we have to uh, uh, do some thinking and see how we're going to scale. Okay? So let's frame the problem that we have right now with all the chaos, with all the like, massive code that we have, with many people contributing to the same code base. So we have a messy mono repo app with everything got into each other and, and it's not organized in any way. First of all, we want some kind of high cohesion. Like similar things should sit right next to each other. So imagine we have a page of, I don't know, managing the company uh, page with all their, um, the, the money that they pay, the people that they sit there, uh, where they sit, a lot of things like this. So to, to all those components, took all your Redux related code, took all your layout, took all your utils, the fetching, the, the, service, uh, the server communication, took all, take all those related stuff and put it right next to each other. Maybe in the same directory, maybe in the same repo, but took them, uh, take them and put them right next to each other. Okay? The next thing is we have a couple of unrelated things we need, we need to have some kind of loose coupling. So if we have the company page and the member page and the search and uh, an office uh, inspection, we need to break it uh, to one from each other. So for example, they usually have imports one from each other. They're usually using maybe some kind of the same components. So they are really mixing together. We need to split those, okay? We need to do some kind of groundwork for breaking it down, uh, so you will be able to manage it uh, better. Now, when we have some kind of modules, okay, they start to look like modules, we need to like surround them some kind of circles. Okay? It's called limited blast radius. Why? Because if one thing broke or break because there is some kind of error, it shouldn't affect the whole app. If I know the messaging component or the messaging feature is not working, I know because the server is not working, because someone uh, put some kind of error or uh, uh, accidentally push up some code that shouldn't be there, it shouldn't affect the whole app. Okay? So pay attention and uh, try to like surround it with something that don't affect the whole application. Maybe it's error boundaries or something uh, related or equivalent in other frameworks. Then we want to take all, all each module's data and put it under the same module. So if we have module A and module B, module B can't like write, uh, read and write this module A data. It can't manipulate it. It can't just read it and change it. Okay, you need to do it via module A, via some API, and we're going to talk about the API, but each module has its own data, and it's important because if I, module A, want to change my data, want to change my scheme, something there, it shouldn't affect others, okay? Like, to, we want to increase some kind of isolation between teams, modules, whatever. The last thing, as I said, um, a lot of modules don't work in isolation. They need something from each other. Okay. If again, if I'm the company component, I need something from the messaging, maybe to some kind to show some kind of notification. I need to have some kind of API. Okay, to grab something. I'm not going to read the Redux store behind the, their legs. I'm going to use some kind of API. Okay. Sounds about right. Um, so when I read and discover and understand those patterns and those principles, me as one that came from the server side, uh, and usually uh, most of my time uh, did server side work, for me it sounds very, very familiar. Okay? For me it sounds like um, microservices <coughs> pattern that I'm used to from the server side, and it's really, really uh, similar. But we are on the front end, so we have a couple of challenges. Um, first of all, on the 
front-end side, the user shouldn't notice that there are a couple of dozens of modules behind the scene. For the user, they need to think that one engineer and one designer and one product manager build the whole thing. Okay? For them, it's not, it doesn't make sense to see a couple of pages with that looks different, that behave different, that communicate different with the users. Okay? It will break their uh, metal capacity and they should use, use it as a single app. Okay? So yeah, behind the scene, it's it going to be breaking a couple of modules, a couple of microphones, but when it got to the user, it should look like and feel like one single application. When you enter the server side, you don't really care like if different services will look different or behave different. You can have one Java server, one Kotlin server, one Node server, and one Go server. Doesn't really, and the user doesn't really care. But when we do, when we talking about UI and look and feel, it should look the same. The next thing is we need to talk about bundle size. When we are on the server side, no one really care about the bundle size. You can use Java with hundreds of jars. Yeah, you don't gonna uh, uh, send it to the client. You can use like hundreds of megas of code, but when you're on the client side, you can't really send dozens of uh, copies of React. Okay, you need to pay attention uh, to the bundle size. So when you can reuse. I don't know, libraries, components, stuff like this, you should do this. The, the, the third principle, the difference between client and, uh, and server, is when you're on the server side, you have the time to warm up, I don't know, warm up cache, uh, like the, the time to interaction or time to actually be interactive uh, with the users, you have more time on the server. On the other side, on the client side, you need to be as responsible as, uh, as fast as possible. And the last thing, that something that I felt, when you have a couple of modules on the server side, you have a declared API that you can interact with, with, between the servers. You have JSON API, uh, you have REST API, you have a couple of ways to talk with each other. But when you're on the client side, there is no standard API to talk between services, between micro uh, or between just modules. Okay? Everyone came up with its own way and it's hard. But overall, the concept is pretty similar and we'll see uh, that most of the micro frontend solution will look something like this. Okay? On the top, you will have some kind of framework that will be responsible for uh, stitching modules together, maybe updating them. If you need some kind of communication there, it will sit there, okay? All the deploy cycle will be responsible from the stitching layer or the framework. Next up, we have some kind of call library that is common for all modules. What we'll see there, the UI component, because remember, we want all the application will somehow feel and look the same. Uh, the user session, you don't want each model will handle the, the authentication, authorization, stuff like this. So it will sit on the common layer and other things like notification, if you have one of the things, uh, their navigation, etc. And after all of this, you have your actual modules. And I'm assuming that you actually can break your monorepo to like isolated squares. Uh, it's not straightforward, there is a lot of work there, but I'm assuming that you are able to do so. And after we are able to do so, now we are able to talk about actual solution to, how to build those microservice, <coughs> a micro frontend architecture. Okay? So, we're gonna talk about a couple of solutions. Um, but when you're gonna choose one, you need to think about your own use case, okay? Because for us, we had a massive 
um, application, existing massive application in a mono repo that a lot of people sit and contribute to this code, but you might choose your micro front end because of different uh, reasons. For example, I know a lot of companies that went to micro front end because they had Angular uh, application and they want to switch the view, for example, but they couldn't do it on one commit. Okay? They want to do it, uh, uh, to, they want to roll out a couple of versions, so they start using micro front end with uh, two applications. One is the uh, old Angular application, and slowly they move a couple of uh, features to view, but meanwhile they add one application with Angular and view. Okay? So there are a couple of use cases there to go to micro front end and you need to think what you need. Maybe you have to use server-side rendering. Maybe um, you need to extract some components to use in another uh, repository. Um, so all kinds of questions that you need to ask yourself be before actually choosing one solution from the one that I'm gonna present, okay? So I talked a lot about the background and why we got here. So let's actually start it. Um, list some kind of uh, uh, framework and solution that we already have out there uh, free to grab. And I split it up to two uh, categories. One of them is whether you are on the same framework. Let's say I'm, I know that my team and my group are going to use React and React only, so I'm okay with this. Uh, and another, the other bucket is I don't know, maybe I want to use React and Vue together, I don't want to, um, to block my options there, maybe I want to use React 15 and 16 together, because I have some kind of old code that I need to still uh, need to support. Even if you have a couple of the same framework version, you still have uh, those options. Okay? So let's start with uh, the case that you have one framework and one single version, okay? Uh, yeah, working, working. The first solution is somewhat straightforward, uh, but it might be a little messy. Uh, we're gonna use NPM modules for this, okay? We take every module and uh, develop it as its own NPM module isolated, probably in a different repository. Okay? There is an option to uh, develop it all on the same repo, but use, like I suggest uh, putting it in a different uh, repository, and you're gonna uh, see why. Uh, it will look something like this, yeah? On one repository, you're gonna uh, deploy your code and publish it to NPM with this kind of package JSON with um, some kind of information about the module uh, and dependency and pay attention that for big dependencies like React or if you use I don't know, Lodash, like leverage the peer dependency option. Peer dependency is, will let you like bundle your NPM, but, but without like actually put React in the NPM, okay? Because if you will have dozens of NPMs module, and each one of them will bring React with it, your bundle size is gonna be huge, okay? So with pure dependency, you just tell NPM, I assume <laughs> that the main app will give this, give the, my, this dependency, okay? Um, and the main application will look like collections of NPM modules. Okay, in the end of the day. Right? Simple as that. Why, is a good, why it is a good solution? Because it like makes you, without any other option, like to isolate your modules. When it's on when, when your old code is on the same repository. It's just too easy to import one module from another. When it's a different uh, repository, it's just not possible. Um, also, we 
in some applications we have some in, in we work we use this uh, solution uh, especially when those components or those modules are also used by another application. So there is a team that develops some kind of API, a couple of components, and it's free for, it, for me to grab, and other uh, apps can grab it too. Um, and just from time to time, I see a new commit on my repository, like the main repository, to just change the, the version number. I don't know what happened behind the scene. It says it's console prompt, uh, uh, but in the end of the day, it's just single commit to change the version. And as, I, and as I said, if this is like a module that change a lot, and every time you need to like push a new feature, you need to do uh, a PR in two branches. It's not that fun. Right? Like every time I just want to change some kind of padding or adding a new button, I'm gonna open a new uh, two PRs. Uh, it's good for uh, I don't know libraries that don't ch change a lot for actually mo for modules that actually serve as libraries. Uh, for us, it's more great because we work with the remote team in Singapore, and they change it and once a month, and every change is a big change, so it works great. It doesn't, it doesn't work for all the use cases. A better use case is using Learn. Who here knows Learner? Okay, so it's some sort of widespread solution that a lot of people already know. Uh, again, it would look something like this. Lerna is a tool that you work on it and it will like, solve for you all the dependencies. Uh, you just need to follow their uh, structure. You will have like a package or a module uh, for each module you have. Each one declare very, very similar to NPM a package JSON with its dependencies, what they need, etc. It will all sit uh, on the same repository um, and it will uh, manage the version for you. Okay? If it's React, if it's Lodash, it will try to uh, merge uh, similar uh, dependencies between modules and it's widely, widely spread. Okay? You probably saw it with Create React App, Babel, and etc. Okay? This is very, very convenient uh, solution, especially if you're working on one repository. Okay, but what if you want to mix and match between frameworks? I want to use vanilla JavaScript, maybe I have some uh, deprecated code in Angular, maybe I want to experiment with Vue, what I'm going to do now. Okay, so one solution for this is uh, using web components. Web component is actually using the DOM, like <coughs> actual HTML elements to look something like this. I have module A. This is the one that my team is working on uh, as part of their responsibility. And I can do whatever I want there. I want, I, I'm able to um, render whatever I want in their inner HTML. I can use React, I can use Vue, whatever. But in the end of the day, I need to um, actually subscribe or declare for the window that I created a costume element. It will call module A and it will wire to my module A plus. Okay? And in my application, I can just use it. Okay? Module A with properties, I can pass whatever I want. And the main HTML will just look like include of all kind of uh, fragments, uh, JavaScript, um, so every team or every module will have its own module something and someone will be responsible for the main page to actually use those and pass the right properties. Um, so again, it's technology agnostic because we are using the HTML behind the scene. We use the DOM API. Um, it's native supported by, I think, most of the browsers. In the last time that I checked, so it's safe to use. Um, and it's really, really isolated between modules. There is no shared uh, state that you can cheat and use. Uh, so it's really useful. What if I want to use something like server-side rendering? Another approach is to give each team 
its dedicated path in the application. So maybe I will have something like slash companies for this team and slash users for this team and slash officers for this team and they have its own dedicated path and they can do whatever they want in the server. I will look like I will use like um, Excel the code of a, a, a server to just serve something like simple Nginx Andri uh, server and every time uh, the client asking for specific path like browse or order I will set something in the environment okay and I will use some kind of template engine very very simple that I can use and then in, in the end of the day my servers are rendering looks like something like this okay and each team will have profile.html or their HTML they will be responsible to create those uh, those uh, HTML files and I don't really care how they do it okay the problem with this is yes it supports server side rendering uh, it really gives isolation uh, to the whole thing but all, not all applications have their dedicated path. For example, in our case, we have the company page, but there are dozens of teams that are working on this company page. Because I need to show their uh, some things about contracts, and I need to show, uh, to show things about members, and I need to show things about uh, how much money they pay, etc. So it's not... It's not uh, always the case that each team has its own dedicated path and also um, the internal navigation what, what happens if I have like components uh, sorry companies less like something less like something and I have internal path is not working so smooth okay for this we can use iframes okay you know it's hard to hear you know, iframe is a bit 90s but bear with me um, it will look very similar to uh, the previous solution, like I have dedicated path, but I will, I am able to uh, mix and match a couple of paths in the same page component. Okay, uh, so I'm able to actually fetch a couple of fragments and put it in a, in iframes. Again, very high level code. I I will share the slides and. I have like, dedicated links for each and every solution uh, with more advanced uh, use cases. But it will look something like this. I understand where I am, I need to understand what, I'm going, what I need to fetch, actually fetching it into, into an iframe. Okay? It's actually more useful than you can think of. Spotify actually using this solution, they're actually using the iframe for the microphone and application. Uh, if you want to feel a bit nostalgic, if you want to use it, uh, but actually make you uh, build your application as separate separate modules because those are iframe. It's really really hard to share things between stuff. Uh, again, it can be a good thing, it might be uh, problematic for you. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about is single SPA. It's very strange name. Like SPA is a single page application, so single, single page application. It's, it's very single. Um, <laughs> um, they have their own, this is a framework, you can read about it uh, on the net. Um, but basically, they have their own syntax and their own way to actually uh, mix between uh, microfrontend or application uh, that you can use. Uh, I won't go over uh, all of them, but in the end of the day, you need to have some kind of app.js. Okay, and the app.js will look something like this. You need to have a bootstrap function, you have to uh, declare a mount function and unmount, okay, to release some resources, uh, and then the framework will start, uh, just attach specific things. Uh, and you will do all the heavy lifting for it. It sounds like perfect, uh, but it's far from it. Uh, it's nice for 
a small application. It, it is nice if you want to experience uh, with the new technology uh, in place. Uh, but in real world example, from what I saw, it's not really a little load, and, and there is some kind of uh, a load issue there. Uh, but you can, it's very, very quick to set up, so you might uh, want to check it out. Uh, it's really nice that you don't have refresh between pages, even if you move between applications. So the concept is good, but it's not yet there for production. Okay? Uh, so, uh, we went over all the use cases that you can use, and we also talked about communication between modules. Yes, we need, most of the cases we need to communicate between um, modules. So we have two options here. One of them is actually use a state behind the scene to share something. Uh, so you can use Relax or Mobex, but again, don't actually read the, from the actual store, use some kind of API, use the selectors of the other module. Um, if you don't use React, only React or only Angular, and you're not able to use those framework, those uh, libraries, I saw application that use Fire, uh, Firebase, thank you, uh, as a state manager behind the scene. It's a bit strange because you need Firebase, for Firebase you need some kind of internet connection, so you actually go to the cloud to get your state, uh, but it works very, very fast and yes, they, they have the caching layer and stuff like this. So I saw application that actually use it. It worked relatively good, surprisingly. This is if you want to use a uh, state paradigm. If you want to use uh, event-based stuff, so you have, again, a couple of native options, uh, dispatch, dispatch event, like uh, from a native use, or event emitter is just wrapping a ball. Um, uh, with a nicer API. We can use just Rx. Uh, again, it might be dangerous here because uh, uh, it might affect your model and their isolation between them. So use it carefully, but you do have uh, solutions there. That's about it. I, I started with uh, a story about ourselves and what we ended up uh, is something between NPM modules for specific use cases and Lerna. We are moving to Lerna uh, because we did, uh, uh, we did this conversation whether we want to keep our options open if we want to use Angular, we want to use Vue, we want to use vanilla JavaScript, and we decided that it's not worth the effort and we want to keep uh, React for all the teams and we actually, uh, every team that want to contribute to this Space Station system has to uh, work on React in the latest version. Uh, this is something that we enforce. Um, and we talked a lot about all kinds of solutions, and I know it's late, so it's really hard to remember everything. Uh, so a couple of things that I want you to remember at the end of the day, even if it's not all the code. Uh, first of all, eventually, especially in our days, when um, a single page application are so common and so easy to contribute code and like dozens of libraries out there, you will get to this point, okay? You will get to dozens of people working on the same application and just getting bigger and bigger. So pay attention to your scale and your developer velocity, where it's got uh, a bit pain. Start to plan ahead before all the things actually start to break. Uh, there is a couple of solutions out there that, are, that you are able to actually use right now and you don't need to implement something on your own. And even if you do, please somehow release it to others so they will, uh, the others will be able to uh, leverage your work. And in the end of the day, it's not the code that it's hard to manage. This is the people that it's hard to manage. If you have like two person that's writing tons of code, 
it will be fine. They will be able to uh, keep on working with this. It, got, it started to get hard when a lot of other people started to work on HeroCode. When other people need to be aligned and you need to sync with them and all kinds of people started thinking differently about the same uh, product and you need to educate them. This is the real pain uh, out there. This is what, what you need to manage eventually. Okay? So, I'm not sure if you, we have time for questions. Uh, as I promised, you can find those slides uh, on my blog. There is like a talks uh, section. Uh, but I want you to, this is like the link. You can like, use the bit.ly link or uh, grab the, the slides for uh, from my son, whatever you want. Okay? Uh, that's about it. Go get some.